And I am honored to be here with Pastor David and Shirley and Jerry and each and every one of you. And um, so I have a, a book. My wife has heard me speak for 30 years, and she decided that uh, we should uh, do a book with the good stories. <laughs> Sometimes I talk about socialism or Islam or things that uh, are a little bit um, uh, serious. And she's like, get to the good part where they pray and things turn around. <laughs> so we um, put together a book called uh, Miracles in American History. And uh, by the way, wasn't that great praise and worship today? Thank you, Kimberly and the team. God bless you. So I picked out some of the stories and here's one, the Battle of Cowpens. And you put some cows in a pen, right? And so it's in South Carolina. The British have a Colonel Tarleton, and he's nicknamed the Butcher because at the Battle of Waxhaw, there were 300 Americans surrendering, and he told his men to pull out their sabers and hack them de to death. And so they called it Tarleton's Quarter. It's like you surrender to him, he kills you. And so he's 26 years old, and he leads the Dragoons, which are the light cavalry. So they're horses that ride really fast and they don't carry much supplies. They're like the F-16s or the F-35s, whatever the fastest plane is, but they're the fastest thing on the battlefield. And um, so Colonel Tarleton's light cavalry is chasing the American general, Daniel Morgan, and he's got a whole army and he's slow and the British are catching up. And so the American general, Daniel Morgan, says, well, we can't outrun him, so we got to fight, but I'm going to pick where. And so he picks a place in front of a river. Now, if you're fighting a battle, you never want to fight in front of a river, because if you're losing, it makes it really hard to run away. <laughs> and so it looked foolish. But Daniel Morgan had his men uh, divided in two. So in the front were the militia, and these were guys straight off the farm, and they were sharpshooters, but they were known for shooting a couple times and then running away. And behind them were the continental soldiers who had been in lots of battles, and they did not run away. And so this Colonel Tarleton is riding, and he sees the Americans in front of a river, and he says, what fools? He tells his men, pull out your sabers, and he orders them to charge. And they're charging, and the militia in front fire once, it takes about a minute or two to reload, fire twice, and then they, they run away. And um, I don't know why my slides are not um, moving. Um, anyway, um, there's a, a slide with shows the battlefield map with the... Uh, Anyway, uh, there we go. So, <laughs> so you can see the arrow and the red coats are the red and the blue they're circling around and they're running away. And the continental soldiers act like they're running away but then on the, the slide on the right, you see that all of a sudden they stop, they turn on their heels, they lower their rifles and at point blank range they shoot and they kill a hundred of the German excuse me the British dragoons and they drop dead well the ones that ran away if you see on that right slide they circle around and they attack the British from the other side and they kill uh, a hundred of the British and they capture 800 and the Colonel Tarleton rides away he escapes and when word gets back to Lord Cornwallis that 100 of his dragoons and 800 were captured, Cornwallis was leaning on his sword. And he leaned so hard, the sword snapped in half. And he was furious and he wanted his 800 dragoons back. And so he starts chasing the Americans. And Nathaniel Green joins up with Daniel Morgan and they're making a haste retreat out of South Carolina across the Catawba River into North Carolina, and they're headed toward the 
Yadkin River. <laughs> and, uh, and so the British are chasing the Americans. The Americans cross the Catawba River. Before the British can cross, there's a flash flood. And the British are delayed a couple days. And then they cross and they're chasing toward the Yadkin River. The Americans cross before the British can cross another flash flood. And this is just south of Winston-Salem where the Yadkin River is. So some of the rain that was up here went down into the river and caused this flash flood to stop the British. The British finally crossed the Yadkin River and now they're making a mad dash for the Dan River to go into Virginia. Well, guess what? There's another flash flood and the British are delayed again and the Americans escape. And so here's the historical marker. Boyd's and Irwin's ferries to the west were used by Nathaniel Green in his passage of Dan River in mid-February 1781, while Cornwallis was in close pursuit. So they're actually watching the Americans get out the other side of the river, but before they can cross this flash flood, puts it, puts it delays them a day or two, they finally cross. And here the um, British commander, Henry Clinton wrote, here the Royal Army was again stopped by a sudden rise of the waters, which had only just fallen almost miraculously, miraculously to let the enemy over, who could not else have eluded Lord Cornwallis's grasp, so close was he upon their rear. <laughs> so this was a miracle in American history. Uh, Yale President Ezra Stiles writes, should we not ascribe to a supreme energy, talking about God, the wise generalship displayed by General Green, leaving his roving uh, Cornwallis to pursue his helter-skelter, ill-fated march into Virginia, right? So he's chasing the Americans, they stop. They cross the river, they get stopped again by the next river. And um, Washington writes, we have abundant reasons to thank Providence. Now you look at the 1828 Noah Webster's dictionary. It says providence, by providence, it is understood the will of God, right? Um, for his many favorable interpositions in our behalf, it has at times been my only dependence for all other resources that seem to have failed us. Well, the General Cornwallis was chasing the Americans. He was burning his supplies because he didn't want to leave them for the Americans to get and he wanted to move really fast. So now Cornwallis is without supplies. He fights the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, and then finally Cornwallis is locked up in Yorktown, and the French come and uh, stop resupplies, and Cornwallis surrenders. Um, but I wanted to jump to some other different stories you may not have heard about. One is the War of 1812, and the British uh, were capturing American ships and impressing our sailors, and uh, the president is James Madison, and he recommends a day of public humiliation and prayer. He says, whereas in times of public calamity, such as that of the war brought on the United States by the injustice of a foreign government, it is especially becoming that the eyes of all be turned to that almighty power in whose hands are the welfare and destinies of nations that they assemble on the second Thursday in September. And I looked it up in a calendar and in that year, it was September 9th in their respective religious congregations. Well, what happened September 10th? Well, that's when 28-year-old Captain Oliver Hazard Perry confronts the British ships on Lake Erie. And Perry uh, had, they, we, didn't need, we did not even have a port on Lake Erie. They had to build the ships on land and drag them across a sandbar to even get them into Lake Erie. Most of his crew were free blacks from Ohio and they had not been in battles before. And the British, their Navy had just defeated Napoleon at the Battle of Trafalgar. And the British Empire was the most powerful empire on the planet. The King of England was a globalist. The sun never set on the British Empire. He controlled uh, India, Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, British Guyana, Canada, Barbados, Bermuda, Jamaica. I mean, he was a, he was a one world government guy with him at the top. And um, so uh, Oliver Hazard Perry is facing the British. The British have long range cannons and they're splintering Perry's flagship, the USS Lawrence to pieces. And <laughs> Perry's cannons can't even reach the British. It looks really bad. And then the wind changes directions. P 
here. He gets on his second ship, the Niagara, and um, the British have to turn their ships around because the wind changes directions. Two of the ships, the HMS Detroit and the HMS Queen Charlotte, attempted to maneuver and turn about, but in the process, they collided and entangle their sails and the ropes and they sat there helplessly trying to untangle this. Well, in that moment, Oliver Hazard Perry sails his Niagara and he is firing every cannon like a madman from both sides of the boat and he ends up uh, dis disabling the entire British squadron in 15 minutes. The smoke clears and he sees all the British ships just helpless in the water. And he tell, turns to his men on deck, the prayers of my wife are answered. <laughs> he, he writes to the Secretary of Navy, it has pleased the Almighty to give the arms of the, of the United States a signal victory over their enemies on this lake. The British squadron, consisting of two ships, two brigs, one schooner, one sloop, have this moment surrendered to the force of my command after a sharp conflict. Well, the president that called the day of prayer is James Madison. He writes, it has pleased the Almighty to bless our arms. On Lake Erie, the squadron under the command of Captain Perry, having met the British squadron of superior force, a sanguinary, which means bloody, conflict ended in the capture of the whole. Never before in history has an entire British squadron been captured at one moment. Well, the British were going to send their famous Duke of Wellington to attack America. But he said, without control of Lake Erie, it's hopeless. And so he says no. Uh, and then, two years later, the Duke of Wellington defeats Napoleon. I mean, he was a really qualified guy. He would have probably defeated the Americans. But he defeats Napoleon at the Battle of Waterloo. And so now the, um, uh, the situation with the Duke of Wellington and Napoleon, uh, the Americans are able to recapture Detroit. And the Indians had joined together with the British, Tecumseh, and um, they're defeated at this Battle of Detroit. Why is this important? Because this gives us the land out of which seven states were formed. Seven states out of the United States that came as a result of Oliver Hazard Perry defeating the British squadron there. And uh, now Napoleon, after the Battle of Waterloo, he's banished to the island of, of Elba and then eventually the island of St. Helena. But the British forces are freed up and they decide to invade Washington, D.C. Now this time the American troops run away. I mean, here's the capital of our nation and the entire British army, I mean, it was 4,500 of them, just simply march into our capital. And our men are like running away, running away. And so Dolly Madison is in the White House and there's all this ruckus going on in the street. What's going on? Everybody's running away. Well, the British are coming. So she had just set the table for dinner. They'd cooked the food, all the dinners there. Her husband's out on the battlefield, you know, directing troops. And um, she has them take the painting of George Washington down, the only painting that Washington stood there for the painting of it. And she rolls it up and she's riding out of town on a carriage while the British Admiral George Cockburn rides into town. He rides up to the White House. He goes inside, sees the table set for dinner, sits down, eats dinner, and then sets the White House on fire. <laughs> and then he uh, goes to the Capitol and he has his soldiers sit in the chairs where all the congressmen ran away. And he goes to the podium, he says, who votes to burn the American Capitol? And they all say, I. And they burn our capital. And then they set fire to the treasury and the Library of Congress. They attack the Navy Yard. And then the sky darkens. Clouds roll in. Wind and thunder grow to a frightening roar. Lightning begins striking. A tornado touches down, sending debris flying, blown off roofs and chimneys on the British soldiers. It even lifts up British cannons and throws them yards away and violent winds slap horse and rider to the ground. And the book, Washington Weather, recorded British Admiral George Cockburn exclaiming to a lady 
Great God, madame, is this the kind of storm to which you are accustomed to in this infernal country? To which the lady replied, no, sir, this is a special interposition of providence to drive our enemies from our city. <laughs> the British forces flee, torrential rains come and put out the fires. And the British have to march back to their ships on roads covered with downed trees. They get back, two of their ships were blown ashore. One had damaged riggings. And a British historian wrote, more British soldiers were killed by this stroke of nature than from all the firearms the American troops had mustered in the feeble defense of their city. It was a miracle that saved our capital. So the Madison, the president, says the enemy, by a sudden incursion, has succeeded in invading the capital of the nation during their possession, though for a single day only, they wantonly destroyed public edifices. Independence is now to be maintained with the strength and resources which heaven has blessed. And so Madison goes on, the two houses of the national legislature expressed that in the present time of public calamity and war, a day may be recommended to be observed by the people of the United States as a day of public humiliation and fasting and prayer to Almighty God. His blessings on their arms, a speedy restoration of peace, of confessing their sins and transgressions, and strengthening their vows of repentance, that he would be graciously pleased to pardon all their offenses. I have deemed it proper to recommend the day of humble adoration to the great sovereign of the universe. You know, I read through all the messages and papers of the presidents, and uh, I stopped with, I didn't get to Obama, I apologize, I sort of... <laughs> got tired of doing it, but, but I put together a book called Prayers and Presidents, and, and I was amazed to see that every colony was started by a different denomination. Virginia was Anglican, Massachusetts was Puritan, Rhode Island was Baptist, Maryland was Catholic, New, New Hampshire and Connecticut were Congregationalists, New York was Dutch Reformed, Pennsylvania was Quaker, and they didn't get along, and they tar and feather each other, but then during the revolution, they said, look, we don't agree with each other on everything, but none of us are happy with the British. Let's work together. And they fought together. Then after the revolution, nine, I read through every state constitution, nine of the original 13 state constitutions, nine of them required all office holders to be Protestant. 98% of the country was Protestant at the time of the founding, 1% Catholic. Catholics were, were only allowed in three states, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and New York. And one-tenth of, of a percent, one-tenth of a percent of the country was Jewish. There were seven synagogues in the whole country. And um, then there was an Irish potato famine in the early 1800s. Millions of Irish Catholics came to America. The Catholic percent went from 1% to 20% in a decade. There was a backlash and there's sort of some, some fighting, but then they calmed down and the states changed, like North Carolina in 1835, North Carolina changed its state constitution from requiring you to be a Protestant to just being a Christian. I had dinner at um, the uh, uh, Chief Justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court, Paul Newby and his wife, May. I had dinner at their house, and we're talking North Carolina constitutional history. And, and do you know it's still in the North Carolina Constitution? It says, uh, beneficent provision for the poor is the first duty of a civilized and Christian state. That's still in there, in the 1971 North Carolina Constitution. Anyway, um, so the vows of repentance, uh, confessing their sins, why is that important? Because they realize that God cannot bless you while you're in sin. Because if God blesses you while you're in sin, he's effectively saying the sin's no big deal. He's effectively giving his consent to sin. And if God gives consent to sin, he's denying his just nature. He's denying himself. And he cannot deny himself. So that puts him in a position where if he were to overlook your sin... Right? That's why we approach him through the lamb, because <laughs> he, he judges, but he judges the lamb. So if you ever played with magnets, there are, uh, if you have them stuck together, and then you turn one of the magnets, what happens? They repel. You can like push them and they just won't touch. So let's say there's two magnets. One is God and the other is you. The God magnet has two sides. One side says, I want to bless you. And the other side says, judgment, right? 
Deuteronomy 28, blessings, cursings. And the U magnet has two sides. One side says repent and believe, and the other side says doubt and sin. And if you have your repent and believe side, facing God's I want to bless you side, the magnets stick together. But if you flip and have your doubt and sin, God still wants to connect. He still wants to bless you, but God cannot bless doubt. Remember Jesus went to his hometown in Nazareth and could do few miracles there because of their unbelief? He wanted to touch it. He wanted to give a miracle, but they didn't believe. And then God cannot bless sin. Now, there's a story when the children of Israel were going into the Holy Land, King Balak got the prophet Balaam to come onto a hill and curse him. And when he opened his mouth, it came out a blessing. And he did, tried it. Let's go to another place. Try it again. It came out a blessing. It happens a third time. And this king, Balak, was pulling his hair out. said, I, I hired you to curse him and you're blessing him. He says, you cannot curse what God has blessed. Amen. But then a couple chapters later, you read where Balaam said, you know, if you send these young Moabite women into the Israeli camp and lure the Israeli men to do their pagan, sexually immoral stuff, once they sin against God, then you can defeat them. And God was so mad at Balaam that a couple chapters later, you see Balaam is killed. And in the book of Revelation, it even mentions Balaam. To the one church, it says, you know, you've sinned, you've, you've um, allowed the sin of Balaam who put a stumbling block in the path of the children of Israel and taught them to commit sexual fornication. Sort of like a woke church nowadays, right? It's, oh, you can do all your free sex stuff. It's all, we, we, Jesus loves everybody. It's like, no, he's a just God. And um, so this understanding that if you, if Balaam gets the Israelites to sin against God, if they sin, then God can't, can't support them in battle because he'd be blessed in their, their sin. And so, uh, but if we insist on having our doubt and sin side, guess what? God's magnet flips to judgment. He is a just God after all. <laughs> and so our founders understood that we need to repent of our sins before we can have faith that God would bless us. And now after the uh, tornado comes and drives the British out of Washington, D.C., the British go to Baltimore. It's the third biggest city in America. It has a big port. Even to this day, it's the biggest port on the eastern coast, Baltimore. So like if a bridge gets knocked down, it really hinders our country. And anyway, so the British go to Baltimore and they fire 1,800 cannonballs nonstop for 25 hours. They have these new cannonballs that explode in the air, bombs bursting in air. And um, Francis Scott Key is an attorney and he wants to do a prisoner exchange. And so he goes on a little boat out to the British boat and the British admiral says, we're not talking prisoner exchange, we're about to attack and I'm not gonna let you go back because I don't want you to warn them. And so you're gonna have to stay here and watch Baltimore get tacked. And so they're firing these cannonballs for 25 hours. And finally, on September 14th of 1814, Francis Scott Key sees through the dawn's early light the American flag still waving. And he writes the Star Spangled Banner. Now, we're all familiar with the first verse, but I think the fourth verse is the one that we ought to sing at the ball games. And it says, Oh, thus be it ever when free men shall stand both between their loved home and the war's desolation. Blessed with victory and peace, may the heaven rescued land praise the power that has made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must when our cause it is just, and this be our motto. In God is our trust. And the star-spangled banner and triumph shall wave over the land of the free and the home of the brave. Well, that motto did get put on our coins by Abraham Lincoln in 1864 and Eisenhower on October 1st of 1957. It got put on our paper currency. Well, the British, after the War of 1812, they no longer have America, but they continue to expand until they became the biggest empire that planet Earth had ever seen. And um, how did they get so big? Well. They uh, would come into countries and do their... So in 1714, they landed in Bengal and uh, they opened a trading post that turned into a trading fort and then they had guns and they would give guns to one kingdom 
and guns to a, another kingdom and then stir up animosity between the kingdom, right? It's called critical race theory. They break them into groups, pit them against each other. And when they fought each other, they would weaken each other and then the British would come in to restore peace and they would take over both kingdoms. And they did this again and again and again until they took over all of India. Now, once they took over India, they put in railroads and steamboats. And uh, in India, a certain group would bathe in the sewage-filled Ganges River and get a waterborne disease called cholera. And then they would get on these British railroads and they would quickly go back to Europe and spread cholera. And it became the disease of the 19th century. And millions died. And you had um, Germany, England, Wales, France, Hungary, Denmark, Italy, China, Japan, Java, Korea, Tunisia. I mean, Philippines, all around the world, people are dying of cholera, this waterborne disease that came from this area of India. And they, uh, uh, an English uh, physician found out it was waterborne by putting a map and putting a little X wherever there was a new case reported of cholera and saw that, gee, there's a whole bunch of them here and right at the middle of it is this town square where there's a well. And he said, hey, I take the handle off the well. And so people couldn't get water. So they would go to the next towns where the other well and, they, and then the, there, those wells weren't uh, contaminated yet. And so the death rates dropped. And they go, aha, uh -huh, the, the, that cholera is living in that water. And so, um, uh, but as it was coming to America in 1832, uh, in New York, you have um, Henry Clay proposed in Congress a joint resolution, a day of public humiliation, prayer and fasting. And it continued to spread. And um, then you had the 1849 California gold rush and with their wagon trains and somebody infected with cholera was on the wagon train. Well, they would pull their wagon trains around the water hole to camp out, but they didn't take care of their sewage, sort of like the message last night. And, uh, and it got into the water hole and infected it. So the next wagon train would come and drink the water and they would die of cholera. 12,000 died of cholera on the California gold rush in the Oregon Trail. And um, Harriet Beecher Stowe, the, um, uh, she's the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, um, she had her infant son die of cholera and President James K. Polk, the, he, he was out of the office, but he died of cholera. 5,000 died in New York, 5,000 in St. Louis, 3,500 Chicago, 3,000 died in New Orleans, 150,000 Americans died of cholera. 8,000 died in Cincinnati. The Ohio postponed its first Ohio State Fair. Dayton Mayor John Howard proclaimed a day of fasting and ordered all stores closed. Hundreds of people knelt openly in the streets and prayed. Could you imagine that driving down the street and seeing all these people just lifting their hands and praying to God in the middle of this cholera epidemic? So the president is Zachary Taylor. And he, on July 3rd, 1849, issues a national day of fasting. And he talks about the fearful pestilence spreading through the land. It is fitting that a people whose reliance has ever been in his protection should humble themselves before his throne. And while acknowledging past transgressions, ask a continuance of divine mercy. It is therefore earnestly recommended that the first Friday in August be observed throughout the United States as a day of fasting, humiliation, and prayer. And then the New Jersey governor, Daniel Haynes, August 1st, 1849 says, whereas the president of the United States in consideration of the prevailing pestilence has set a day of fasting. And whereas I believe that the people of this state recognize the obligations of a Christian nation publicly to acknowledge their dependence on almighty God, that abstaining from their worldly pursuits, they assemble with humble confession of sin, fervently implore the almighty ruler of the universe to remove from us the scourge and speedily restore to us the inestimable blessing of health. Well, guess what? That was the beginning of August. At the end of the month, the death rates drop off. And you go from the 1700 and 200 and 1196 down to zeros and one. So they had a miracle in American history. We should maybe try that rather than all the, uh, the masks and vaccines. Anyway, um, so now we, uh, 
We come to World War I. My grandfather fought in the 338th Machine Gun Battalion in France in World War I, and they had all the poison gas, and that, but um, the president's Woodrow Wilson, and he gives an order in 1918. The president, commander in chief of the Army and Navy, enjoins the observance of the Sabbath, the importance of man and beast of the prescribed weekly rest, sacred rights of Christian soldiers, the best sentiment of a Christian people, demand that Sunday labor in the Army and Navy be reduced to the measure of strict necessity. Well, he issues a day of fasting. The Democrat president, May 11th, 1918, in time of war, humbly to acknowledge our dependence on Almighty God, implore his, protection, his aid and protection, a day of public humiliation, prayer, and fasting. Exhort my fellow citizens of all faiths and creeds to assemble on that day in their several places of worship to pray Almighty God that he may, what? Forgive our sins. You think they, so uh, Jack Hibbs is a friend of mine, and he was invited to... Uh, give the opening prayer in Congress, like, you know, two months ago. And he just basically read through some, uh, most of his prayer was drawn from these previous prayers. And, uh, and he said something that, you know, that we, you know, can repent of our sins. 26 Democrats signed a letter banning Jack Hibbs from ever coming into the Capitol again. It's like, they say, how dare he say that we have sins that we need to repent of? And it's like, that shows how we've changed. Um, anyway, so this Democrat president, Woodrow Wilson, passes out New Testaments and Book of Psalms from the New York Bible Society. And he writes the foreword and General John J. Pershing writes the foreword and they pass it out to the millions of the US soldiers. And one of the stories, from World War I, October 8th, 1918. The American battalion is pinned down by machine gun fire along the Dacauville rail line, north of chatel Chere, France. Sergeant Alvin York says, the Germans got us. They stopped us dead in our tracks. Their machine guns up there on the heights overlooking us and well hidden. We couldn't tell for certain where the terrible heavy fire was coming from. Those machine guns were spitting fire, cutting down the undergrowth all around me. Well, all of eight of Sergeant York's group were killed. But he's from the backwoods of Kentucky and Tennessee, and he's a sharpshooter, and he's on the ground, and he starts picking off those machine gunners. And then he said, uh, I, I could shoot better standing up. And so he stood up, and then they wouldn't lift their heads up anymore, and he, he would make turkey calls. Gobble, gobble, gobble. And the guy would lift up and said, boom. <laughs> and he would just shoot him. And, um, and then he was charged from behind, and these guys had bayonets, and he pulls out his revolver, and he says, I shot him the way you shoot turkey. You shoot the furthest away one first, because if you shoot the closest one, they scatter, and you'll never get them. And then he turns around, and he's like shooting them, and... Um, uh, you know, later somebody questioned whether that happened and they had somebody go over there with a metal detector and they went to the battlefield and they sure, sure enough, they found this one spot with all these shells all around it. And, um, but finally a little stick comes up with a flag, a white flag, and the German commander marches them down and he captures 132 Germans single-handedly. And, um, and then he, uh, he marches them down the road and they're not about to run away because they know he's a sharpshooter, <laughs> he'll pick them off. And he gets the Medal of Honor. Some of them officers have been saying that I being a mountain boy and accustomed to the woods, done all these things right just by instinct. I had not never got much learning from books except the Bible. Maybe my instincts are more natural, but that ain't enough to account for the way I come out alive with all those German soldiers raining death on me. I'm a telling you the hand of God must have been in that fight. Just think of them, 30 machine guns raining fire on me, point blank from a range only 25 yards. And all them there, rifles and pistols besides, and those bombs. And then those men charged with fixed bayonets, and I never received a scratch and bringing 132 prisoners. I've only got one explanation, that God must have heard my prayers. Amen. He comes back to America and he opens a Bible institute. <laughs> Sergeant York Bible Institute. Gary Cooper did a movie about him. 
And uh, another, Eddie Rickenbacker. He's a race car driver, Fast Eddie, all right, over in uh, Illinois. And he's the chauffeur for General Pershing over there because he's a good driver. And he sees these things in the sky called airplanes. And he goes, I want to do that. So on the battlefield, he just switches. And he goes over and learns how to fly a plane. And he joins the 94th Aero Squadron. And they shoot down dozens of the enemy. And, and he gets the Medal of Honor. And he writes a book called Fighting the Flying Circus. Because you're going in circles around the clouds. And one story, three quarters of an hour of gasoline remained and no compass. And then I thought, the North Star. Glory be, there she shines. I have been going west instead of south. Keeping the star behind my rudder, I flew south for 15 minutes, then found myself above the River Muse. Picked up our faithful searchlight, and 10 minutes later, I landed. As I walked across the field to my bed, I looked up and repeated most fervently, thank God. Well, he writes, um, now in his squadron was Quentin Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt's son. And he was really courageous, and he was a really good fighter, and he got killed. And uh, Eddie Rickenbacker writes, I had seen others die brighter and more able than I. I knew there was a power. I believed in calling upon it for aid and guidance. I am not such an egotist as to believe that God spared me because I am I. I believe there is work for me to do and that I am spared to do it just as you are. So World War II... Franklin Roosevelt gives out Gideon's New Testaments and Book of Psalms to all the soldiers by the millions. I have a copy of one. You can buy them on eBay. And um, he writes the foreword to it. A Democrat president, he says to the armed forces, as commander in chief, I take pleasure in commending the reading of the Bible to all who serve in the armed forces of the United States. Throughout the centuries, men have found in the sacred book words of wisdom. It is the fountain of strength, signed Franklin D. Roosevelt. Roosevelt said, your government is working with representatives of Catholic, Protestant, and Jewish faiths. Without these three, all three of them, things would not be as easy. You wonder if they'd call Franklin Roosevelt a Christian nationalist. Right? He's defending our nation, and he's Christian. <laughs> well, Eddie Rickenbacker. So now he um, is the owner of the Eastern Airlines and owner of the Indianapolis 500 Speedway. And he is asked by the government to inspect military bases in the Pacific. And they're leaving California and then they're leaving Hawaii. And if you're just a little bit off with your compass, hundreds of miles out, you're way off. And they run out of gas and have to ditch in the ocean. And uh, there were eight of them. One of them had died, and so there, the seven of them, he wrote, wrote, wrote a book called The Seven Came Through, and they are in three little dinghy boats. And um, so um, you have uh, these little boats, and he says that the ocean looks nice and smooth when you're in the airplane, but when you're down there, these 12-foot swells, and you're just going up and down. And um, they uh, have the flight engineer, Private Johnny Bartek, and he wrote in out, Life Out There in 1943 that he had his little pocket New Testament that was given out by the millions. And um, Eddie Rickenbacker uh, told him to start reading it. And uh, they had one time where they're, they're baking in the sun, just floating in the ocean. I mean, they, they don't, and um, they see a cloudburst like right over there. And they're like, ah, oh. <laughs> and they pray and the cloudburst moves right over their little dinghy rafts. And they're like getting their parched tongue all covered with water and they're wringing out their clothes. And, and then they were starving. It was 28 days they were on the ocean. And Bartek writes, but as we went on, we all began to believe in the Bible and God and prayer. And they saw a seagull circling. We prayed and prayed for the seagull to land so we could catch him. After reading the passage about, about, about God takes care of the, the lilies of the field, he's going to take care of you. After reading the passage, about 20 minutes later, that's when the seagull landed on Eddie Rickenbacker's head. <laughs> and 
And, um, and so like really slowly, he like goes up there and he catches it and they wrestle it and kill it and they eat the innards and, and they use the, the guts for uh, fishing and one guy has a key ring and they bend it and they make a hook out of it and they catch fish. And, and Eddie Rickenbacker is finally rescued. The newspaper's famous ace a party rescued by Navy plane. And Rickenbacker said, I pray to God every night of my life to be given the strength to inspire in others the obligation we owe to this land for the sake of future generations. For my boys and girls, so that we can look back when the candle of life burns low and say, thank God I have contributed my best to the land that contributed so much to me. Well, Europe, World War II, D-Day. You have a 50 mile stretch and the American and the English and the allies are landing. Um, and they had many casualties, uh, 9,000 of them. They said the water was red with blood. It's called Operation Overlord. And uh, my uncle died there. I never met him. He's my mom's only brother, uh, Wilford Orville Epperson. And, uh, but Franklin Roosevelt gives a D-Day prayer. Almighty God, our sons, pride of this nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, on our civilization. And he goes, now by the way, uh, Chris Long of the Ohio Christian Alliance gets my American Minute emails I send out, you can sign up for, and it's little history stories. And, and I had mentioned World War II, that the big memorial that they built there had zero mentions of God. Jefferson Memorial mentions God, Lincoln Memorial mentions God, but not the World War II Memorial. So Chris Long got his congressman, Rob, uh, um, Bill Johnson and Senator Rob Portman to introduce in the Congress to add Franklin Roosevelt's D-Day prayer to the World War II Memorial. It took him 11 years, passed Congress, but then they didn't fund it because it's a prayer. And so he has to raise the money. And, but they finally dedicated it last year. It's just 50 yards from the World War II Memorial. It's called the Circle of Remembrance, four bronze plaques with D -Day, Franklin Roosevelt's D-Day prayer because he's a Democrat, right? And so he was able to get through Congress. And it's the only place on the mall in Washington, D.C. dedicated to a prayer. So um, Franklin Roosevelt said, the whole world is divided between pagan brutality and the Christian ideal. We choose human freedom, which is the Christian ideal. Those forces hate democracy and Christianity. They oppose democracy because it is Christian. They oppose Christianity because it preaches democracy. So they land Battle of the Bulge, or um, the, the D-Day, and they're pushing back, and now there's the Battle of the Bulge. And if you were to look at a map, do you see the line going from north to south? That's how we pushed them back. But if you see it's a little bit lighter, there's a, a bulge in the line. Well, the Germans were running out of gas, and they wanted to make it to Antwerp, Holland, where there's a port so they can get some ships, so they can get gas. And um, so it's called the Blitzkrieg, a lightning war. And they're going out there. They have like panzer divisions and their troops. I mean, this is a major thing. Well, well the um, Eisenhower says, by rushing out of his fixed defenses, the enemy may give us the chance to turn his great gamble into his worst defeat. So I call upon every man of the allies to rise now to new heights of courage with unshakable faith in the cause for which we fight. We will, with God's help, go forward to our greatest victory. And so we drop in the 101st Airborne. Well, guess what? The Nazis had gone so fast that now they're behind enemy lines. And they're at a little town called Baston with eight roads that come together. It's a very strategic spot. And the Nazis got all their tanks and panzer divisions that are surrounding it. It's super freezing cold. The, they couldn't even get their shovels to dig foxholes because the ground was so cold, it was like cement. And, and so the Nazis send a message to the American general, Anthony McAuliffe, and it says, you're surrounded, surrender. And Anthony McAuliffe gave a one word response, nuts. <laughs> that was his response. And you can imagine the, the German messenger taking it back to his commander. Well, what does this American general say? He says, nuts. <laughs> hmm, is that yes? Is that no? <laughs> well, the Germans start firing and they are pounding away the Americans are down to rationing eight bullets a day. I mean, you have to be really careful where you're shooting. And coming to their rescue is General Patton with the Third Army. 
and he is pinned down because of the weather. It's foggy like you've had here, and it's snowy and rainy and wet, and so he gets his chaplain, James O'Neill, and gives him an order. Compose a prayer for the weather to clear. And he's like, well, I'm not sure you can do that. And he goes, do it. If you saw the movie on Patton, it's in there. Well, they print the prayer on a quarter of a million index cards, and they pass them out to the soldiers. My father-in-law, before he died, was in a nursing home and the guy in the door next to him, you know, they're all proud of their military achievements. Thank God for those veterans. And, but he had a card of this. And on the flip side was Patton's Christmas greeting to his troops. But this prayer said, Almighty and most merciful Father, we humbly beseech thee of thy great goodness to restrain these immoderate reigns. Hearken to us as soldiers to call upon thee. Establish thy justice among men and nations. Well, guess what? They pass it out to the 250,000 soldiers. They read the prayer. They pray the prayer. The next day, the sky clears. And the allies can now send their planes. They can bomb. And that gives cover for the troops to go. And they get to Baston. They rescue the 101st Airborne. And the Nazis run out of gas. I talked to a soldier. This was 20 years ago, so he's gone on. But he fought at the Battle of the Bulge. And he said it was freezing cold and we, these tanks were coming and they were just a cornfield away from us and they were getting closer and closer. And all of a sudden you hear them go, Runk. they run out of gas. And then the lid opens, clunk, clunk. Then the guys scurry out and they go away and there's all these abandoned tanks like everywhere. And, uh, and so the, the Nazis out of gas, they're pushed back, pushed back. They're finally pushed to Berlin, and that's when Hitler blows his brains out in 1945 in April, and the war ends. And, uh, but it's a miracle in American history, right? And, and European history, too. Cold War, Fran uh, Terry S. Truman, uh, 1952, made the National Day of Prayer an annual event. In times of national crises, when we are striving to strengthen the foundations of peace, we stand in special need of divine support. And then the Apollo space program. Uh, I actually took this picture myself. I spoke in an event down there at NASA with um, General Bob Stewart, the highest ranking army general that flew in the space shuttle. If you can see underneath of the Saturn V rocket, which is a football field long, you'll see some Tables and chairs. That's where we had our event. We were under, I could, you could all touch this rocket. It was like totally amazing. And, um, and, and General Bob Stewart has more hours in a extravehicular activity, right? The backpack, right? And so he, he was, he was just a fo photograph of him a million feet above the earth, right? He's, he doesn't have any cables or anything. He's just there with his backpack. And anyway, uh, so the Apollo space program. And uh, let's look at Apollo 13. And it's going to go to the moon, and an oxygen tank explodes. April 11th, 1970. Houston, we've had a problem. <laughs> and um, I uh, got a chance to go hunting one time with Gary Sinise. And in the movie, he plays one of these astronauts. And um, uh, I said, How did you do those weightless scenes? And he goes, oh, the vomit comet. These planes would fly up to like 50,000 feet and then drop. And for two minutes, you'd be weightless. And that's when they'd, they'd film the scenes in these little two-minute clips. And anyway, but the real time of the uh, Apollo 13, it explodes. And uh, Nixon has a day of prayer. And they piece together an oxygen filter using all kinds of stuff because, you know, they, they're they're breathing their own uh, breath and their oxygen levels going down and then they're running out of electricity. And so they are able to take the battery charge out of the lunar landing module because they're not going to use that. And they transfer the battery charge back into the command module, but they have to save energy. So they turn off all the heat right. and they, I've talked to some astronauts <laughs> It is super freezing cold up there in space, right? There's nothing, and they're shivering, and then their moisture is condensing uh, on the windows, and, um, and then they manually land this thing next to a hurricane. But the whole country, the whole world was praying. They had prayer at the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. They had prayer at the Vatican, and, and um, here's a, a church in uh, New York, and it says, um, 
Uh, today, special prayer for Apollo 13. The whole world is praying. Well, guess what? It lands near a hurricane, and they rescue the astronauts. And Nixon said, April 19th, 1970, we, when we learned of the safe return of our astronauts, I asked that the nation observe a national day of prayer and thanksgiving today. This event reminded us that in these days of growing materialism, deep down there is still a great religious faith in this nation. I think more people prayed last week than have prayed in many years in this country. We pray for assistance of God when faced with great potential tragedy. And so there they are praying on deck. They do include this scene in the movie. And here, if you look, they're praying on deck in the screen, but then this is the Houston head, headquarters, and they're all praying. So you got two groups praying, and Time Magazine cover is the astronauts praying. And they even had a coin, Apollo 13, when the whole world prayed. And um, so 1988, Reagan made the National Day of Prayer the thirst, first Thursday in May. Americans in every generation have turned to their maker in prayer. We have acknowledged our dependence on Almighty God. You know, I was wondering why God made us anyway. In 2003, they focused the powerful Hubble telescope on a spot in the sky where there was nothing. The spot was the size of a grain of sand held between your fingers at arm's length against the night sky. Tiny spot, nothing there. They kept the uh, telescope focused on it for 11 days. When they finally developed the images, in that tiny spot with nothing there was 10,000 galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars in each galaxy. And this is the picture. It's the Hubble Ultra Deep Space Field. It's the furthest picture ever taken away from planet Earth. And every dot you see is a galaxy with hundreds of billions of stars. This is not an artist's rendition. That's the actual photograph, all of that in a little tiny dot. Now with the James Webb telescope, they can see it even clearer. And you can see the red shift. So light travels in waves, with blue being the shortest wave and red being the longest wave and the Doppler effect. And so as you're seeing these waves, the red, you're seeing the galaxies moving away from us. They now estimate that the observable universe is 93 billion light years across and still expanding at the speed of light. And the largest star they found is Stevenson 2 18. It's a super gas giant. If you were to place Stevenson 2 18 in our solar system, it would engulf the orbit of Saturn, the sixth planet from the sun. We're the third planet from the sun. Could you imagine one single star that enormous? And God made it all. And God made you. Why would he make you? What could you possibly offer a being that is that powerful? Nothing. Except maybe something. What's a galaxy anyway? It's a bunch of rocks. Hot rocks, cold rocks, enormous rocks, vaporized rocks. A rock cannot love you. So it's almost like at some time in eternity past, God said, been there, done that. I can make everything. I would really like someone in my image that could love me. Now it gets interesting because love by definition must be voluntary. The moment it's forced, it evaporates. The challenge for God was not that he creates everything. It was to create something that he did not control. So God made everything. He made you. And he, he made it so that we're free will beings. So, um, so, out of everything he made, time, matter, space, energy, he intentionally made one tiny thing he does not control, your will. 
So in the context of everything he controls, he created one tiny thing he does not control, your will. Now, he could control it if he wanted to, but that would defeat the very reason he made us different than everything else. And he doesn't need our love. He's not incomplete and our love somehow completes him. No, he doesn't need our love, but he wants it. Parents don't need the love of their children, but they want it. And the more you love someone, the more you want that someone to love you back. God loves you infinitely. He has an infinite desire for you to love him back. But he'll never force you. Because the moment he would force you to love him, he himself would know he's forcing you to love him. And he would know your response is not a love response. So he'll never force you. Think of it. You're made in God's image. What's the most important thing in your life? Well, somewhere near the top of the list, it's loving and being loved. If you're made in God's image, could it be that loving and being loved is a big deal to God? Now, God loves everything he created. But the question is, could what he created love him back? Galaxies can't love. Rocks can't love. Animals follow instinct. I looked up the word angel in the King James Bible. It appears 289 times. Not one time is the word love used to describe an angel's relationship with God. They worship God. They praise God. They glorify God. The word angel means messenger. They deliver God's messages. They deliver God's judgments like in Egypt. They sang when the stars were created. They rejoice when a sinner converts. They're heavenly witnesses. Jesus says, I'll confess you before the angels. But they're not made in God's image. And Jesus did not die on the cross for angels. They are incomprehensibly intelligent and powerful beings. But they were made for a purpose. What purpose were you made for? We're not very smart and we're not powerful. You know, a king can have a castle with really powerful soldiers and really smart staff, and then he can have children. Guess what? The word love is used all throughout the Bible to describe men and women's relationship with God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Psalms 91, because he set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. Jesus rose from the dead and said, Peter, do you love me? We are beings unique out of all creation because we have the ability to love God back. But for love to be loved, it must be voluntary. He'll never force us because if he forces us, he knows he's forcing us. He knows it's not a love response. So I was thinking how God can give us free will to love him back, but him still be in control of everything. You know, God created light. Light is a photon, which is a perpendicular wave in the electromagnetic field that travels at 186,000 miles per second. And so when God stretched out the heavens, he also stretched out the electromagnetic field so light could travel across the heavens. And now they're finding there's all kinds of fields. There's a Higgs field and, there are all these, and these waves and, and the quantum field theory. And, and so Einstein's theory of relativity is the closer you could travel approaching the speed of light, for you, time would slow down. And if you could travel the speed of light, for you, time would stand still. God created light. He's faster than light. So for God, time stands still. We'll never comprehend that. But there is a verse in the Bible that says, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. Imagine experiencing one day as if it was a thousand years. In other words, we are living in slow motion compared to God. God exists in the ever-present now. I am that I am. When you are in God's presence, you cannot think about the past. You cannot think about the future. You can't even think. You just experience, I'm in the presence of all power in the universe. Irresistible love, terrible judgment all at once. And so for God to create our reality, he had to create a space-time bubble where everything moves in slow motion compared to now. He had to basically take now and stretch it out and slow it down. Now, why is this important? Because you get to make your free will decision in time, but God's outside of time. He can readjust every electron in the universe. 
before he lets time move, move forward in the next nano frame. So it's our limited free will in the context of his unlimited sovereign will. And it works because he's outside of time. And we sort of know this because if you're somewhere with somebody and you say, you know, it's no coincidence that you and I are, are right here right now. This is a God ordained moment. This is, this is providential. This is God that orchestrated this. And you feel these goosebumps that, that God arranged it for you to be right there at that moment. And because God's outside of time, that means he can be with each one of us every single moment of every single day, 100% completely with each one of us all the time. And God has a will for our life. And if we, we are his workmanship, we're created to do these good works. And if we submit to his will, we walk in the fullness of it. Or we can fudge. And it says some produce 30-fold, 60-fold, or 100-fold, right? There's the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. And then we can harden our heart and say, no, God, I'm, I'm not going to do that. And he's like, okay, I'm going to get my will done. I'll just use somebody else. Right. It's like Mordecai told Esther. If you rise up, God will use you to deliver the Jews. But if you don't, God will raise up somebody else to deliver the Jews. He's going to get his will done. You know, I was thinking of a way of explaining this. Imagine you are driving your car and you have GPS on your phone. And you make a wrong turn and it recalculates. What if the guy in the car next to you is making a wrong turn and his is recalculating at the exact same time? What if everybody in the city is making wrong turns and it's recalculating all at the same time. What if everybody in the world? So we make good decisions. We make bad decisions. God's outside of time. He recalculates every electron in the universe before he lets time move forward to the next nanoframe. So we get to make our free will decisions, but he's still in, in ultimate control of everything. So God creates us as free will beings that can love him back. He creates time, so we have our free will, but he's still in control. There's a third thing. He has to hide himself behind his creation. Because if he ever revealed himself to you in all of his universe-creating omnipotent power, brighter than a trillion, trillion suns, your response, if you didn't melt would be like the Apostle John in the book of Revelation, I fell at his feet, is dead. In the presence of all the power in the universe, boom, you'd be flat. And God's like, I can do involuntary responses all eternity long. He is completely awesome. He's like, I'm interested in this voluntary response. I'm interested in this love response. So he has to hide himself. People say, if God's real, why doesn't he show himself? Because the moment he shows himself, your free will's gone. And the same hiding of himself that allows us to have free will necessitates that we have faith. You need to thank God you don't know the future. Because if we knew the future, we wouldn't need to pray. We wouldn't need to seek the Lord. What's going to happen? Why, why seek the Lord? No, he hides it. Why? So that we have to seek him. I was trying to think of a way of explaining how God hiding himself is necessary for our response to him to be a love response. Imagine a billionaire has a son who goes to college and he flies in on his private jet, drives up in his Lamborghini, $40,000 Rolex watch, gold rings, fancy clothes. He's gonna have every girl on campus wanting to meet him. But if he lays that aside and drives up in a clunker and he's got holes in his jeans, all the uppity girls are gonna ignore him. But then there's a girl that likes to study with him in the library and they eat together in the cafeteria and they become friends. And she takes heat from the clique for hanging around this nobody guy, but she believes in him. They fall in love, they get engaged. And then one day he says, hey, I, I wanna take you back to meet my dad. And they're like driving up to this castle mansion estate and the girl's like, whoa, you didn't tell me about all this. He knows that she loves him for him, not because of all of his stuff. Yeah. 
If Jesus would have come in his glory, every political ladder climber, I'm your friend, sure, I love you. No, he's born in a manger. It says in Isaiah 53 of the Messiah, there was nothing in his countenance that would make us want to desire him. He only wants those that love him for him. So God creates us as free will beings that can love him back. He creates time so we have our free will, but he's still in control. He hides himself so that we have an opportunity to use our free will, but there's a last thing. He's just, and he cannot help it. He's just. He is a God of rules and laws. Everything he makes, laws of planetary motion, laws of gravity, laws of physics, laws of optics, everything's laws. And he has laws for human behavior. We just have the choice as to whether or not to follow the laws. But he's a God of laws. He's just. Abraham says to the Lord, shall not the, God, the, the judge of all the world do justly? He, he has to be just. In mathematical equations, there's constants and variables. The constant is God is just, was, is, and forever will be just. That'll never change. The variable is who takes the judgment, you or a substitute. So God is just, which means he has to judge every sin. Because if he does not judge a sin, by default, his silence would be giving consent to the sin. It's the rule of tacit admission, T-A-C-I-T, and it's in a wedding ceremony. Right? The pastor says, anyone against this wedding, speak now or forever hold your peace. If you're silent holding your peace, you're giving consent to the wedding. If there are sins and God is silent not judging the sin, by default, he'd be giving consent to the sin. And if God gives consent to one sin, one time... He denies his just nature. He denies himself. He ungods himself. He's kicked out of heaven. And he is not going to get kicked out of heaven. And he is not going to deny himself. And he is going to judge every sin. So he could never be loved back. Because if he creates free will beings, creates time, hides himself so we can use our free will. But if we step out of line one time, he has to judge us because if he doesn't judge our sin, he's giving consent to the sin. And if he gives consent to sin, he's denying himself and he cannot deny himself. So he could never be loved back until he came up with a plan. He actually had the plan before he created the first electron. And the plan was his own son would become a man and only as a man could God die on a cross to pay for our sins. Charles Wesley wrote the hymn, Amazing love, how could it be that thou, my God, should die for me? So God is just in that he judges every sin, but he's love in that he provided the lamb to take the judgment for the sin. Abraham and Isaac are going to the top of Mount Moriah. And Isaac says, Father, we have the wood for the sacrifice. We have the coals for the sacrifice, but where's the sacrifice? And Abraham says, son, God will provide himself a sacrifice. And it has a double meaning. I'm trusting God will have the ram up in the bush, but the other is God will provide himself. And that's what happened. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the only begotten son of God, in the plan of redemption that was hidden from ages. It was a hidden plan. It says, if the princes of this world had known, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. The apostle Paul called it the mystery of the gospel. In this hidden plan, Jesus, the son of God, became man and he became the lamb of God and he took the wrath of a just God upon himself in our place. You know, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. Jesus experienced that day on the cross as if it was a thousand years. That's why he was sweating drops of blood. You know, I have a degree in accounting. I've said this many times, and, and I like things that balance. So you take an eternal being, Jesus, who is innocent, suffering for a finite, limited period of time. It's equal to all of us finite, limited beings who are guilty, suffering for an eternal period of time. Let me say that again. An eternal being who's innocent, suffering for a finite period of time, is equal to all of us finite beings who are guilty, suffering for an eternal period of time. Infinity times finite equals finite times infinity. An unlimited being suffering for a limited period of time is equal to all of us limited beings suffering for an unlimited period of time. Jesus suffered the equivalent of eternal damnation in all of our places. And he's the only one that could have done it. And out of love for the Father, and out of love for you and me, he became the Lamb. You know, I read the book of Revelation, still trying to figure it out. Read through it thousands of times. I have it on my app. I listen to it. 
But one thing seems clear. It's God that is pouring out the vials of judgment in the book of Revelation. Lamb breaks a seal. Angel throws a censer. Angel blows a trumpet. It's like, why is it? Well, God's a just God. He has to judge every sin he missed along the way. So you can't get 10,000 years into eternity and say, God, there was a sin way back when, and you didn't judge it, and you were silent. Were, were you giving consent to that sin? Is there a party that's unjust we didn't know about? Uh-uh. It says the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. And the angels cry out, righteous and true are your judgments, O Lord. Nobody's going to question for the rest of eternity that God judged sin. But that's the final judgment. He will not do any more judging for the rest of eternity. But in that sense, Jesus had the equivalent of the book of Revelation judgment poured out on his head. Jesus took the judgment for every sin that everybody would ever do upon himself on the cross, experienced it as if it was a thousand years, and then he rose from the dead to prove he was who he said he was. The lamb is God's way to love you without having to judge you. It's his plan. He came up with it. It was his way to get around his just nature. It's his plan so he can love you for the rest of eternity. You can love him back for the rest of eternity and not have to worry about being judged by him because all the judgment you deserve went on Jesus who suffered in our place and we are approaching this just God through Jesus. Jesus is the way. This way you and I can approach this universe creating, omnipotent, all-powerful, and all-just God without having to worry about being judged. The lamb slain from the foundations of the world. And Jesus rose from the dead to prove he was who he said he was. And then he fills you with the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. And the Holy Spirit comes on the inside of you and shares the love of God to a lost and dying world. And we love God back directly through our praise and worship, and we love God indirectly by loving men and women made in his image. So the God who controls time arranged it for you to be here at the gathering. Arranged for you to be here right now. This very moment so that you could hear of his infinite love for you and how he made a way that you can love him back and it's not based on you being good enough. It's based on you approaching him through the lamb that he provided. So today, let's bow our heads and go before the Lord and just say this prayer under your breath. Heavenly Father, you are my Father. You created everything out of nothing. You created me, but I have sinned against you. I deserve judgment. I thank you for sending your Son, Jesus, to die on the cross and suffer in my place and pay for my sins. Jesus, you are my Lord. I believe you died on the cross, you were buried in the grave, and you rose again from the dead, and I am risen with you. I am yours. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I invite you into my heart and my life. Speak through me. Think through me. Act through me. Love through me. Father, I thank you for Jesus. And I thank you for using me now by the power of the Holy Spirit for the rest of my life on earth and for all of eternity. In Jesus' name.